on Information Technology at INSAF University of Lyon, France. He was appointed Emeritus Professor at K KSI United States to, during his career. He has supervised 44 doctoral students and was member of PhD committees in 17 countries. He worked in the United, the United Kingdom, United States, Italy, Argentina, and Mexico. So, uh, please join me in welcoming Robert Laurini. Robert, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good, good, good morning for uh, everyone. I will present a research agenda on knowledge management for regional policies. You can um, download this um, this uh, talk. You know so there is a URL if you are interested by downloaded by by uh, downloading my, my my talk. Okay, and um, okay. As you know, knowledge management is more and more common in business in companies. Okay, and it's at its beginning in smart cities, but there is no research, I say no research, at regional level. So it was decided to, to organize a European brainstorm workshop to develop a research agenda. The content of my talk will be as follows. First, the origin of the research agenda, uh, contents, okay analysis of some research lines and conclusion. In total, we have developed more or less 40 uh, research lines. I have no time in, uh, in uh, less than one hour to, to present all those um, um, lines, research lines. And I will only, I will give you the list. Okay, give at the same time some additional information. And, but uh, at the end, I, I will analyze only a few, a few lines. Okay. What are the problems? First, as you know, we have difficulties by deciding what are boundaries of a region. Sometimes it's very clear, you know, when you say, for example, a, a county in the states or a, a state in a, a, in in South America or in, you know, or but when we have a region, for example, the uh, Cordillera, okay, and the Andes, Amazonia, you don't know exactly where are the boundaries. Okay, well, this is one of the problems. First, knowledge management. What could be the characteristic of knowledge management, okay, for dealing with uh, uh, regional policies? What is the level of acceptability of local authorities in charge of regional governance? We know um, by comparison with the small cities that some elected people are not very, do not agree a lot with artificial intelligence. But anyway, uh, we, we, there are some possibilities. And from a computing point of view, how to introduce space and time issues in logic, you know, uh, knowledge management is essentially based on logic, first order logic. But we're dealing with territories, we need to in integrate the space, okay? 2D, 3D space, and time. What are the main differences between smart cities and smart region? Smart cities, we have a dense habitat. There are a lot of public services, health, education, urban traffic, metro lines, shop industry. But, but smart region, is they include several towns and cities, various density of population from, uh, from a, a, a desert, more or less, and a cities. We have to, to deal with agriculture, biodiversity, natural parks, traffic infrastructure, and, and so on. And, but each region has its own DNA. And indeed, each region has its own peculiarities. But we define by the set of characteristics 
we are which are critical to shape its future, future and beyond extractive resources, creativity, economic resources, touristic and historical resources, and so on. First, I will speak about region boundary. A, a very uh, a classical problem is regarding a valley and a hill. Where is the limit of the valley and the hill? Okay, you have what we can say is kind of fuzzy boundary. So we have regions which have no boundaries and some other which have fuzzy boundaries. By fuzzy boundaries, I mean that in a point, you know, we can say yes, 10% of belonging to, um, uh, to a place or 90%. The other problem is when we have borders. Borders, I mean, for everything. It could be a river, it could be a, a, a road, it could be different surveyors give different coordinates. And, and the problem is that the boundaries do not match. For example, su suppose we have two, two, or two, two, two counties, uh, the green one and the red one. You know, as you can see, there are some variation at the border. And it means that sometimes we have difficulties um, in not only first in databases and second in knowledge management regarding this kind of uh, uh, differences. Definition of regional knowledge. Regional knowledge corresponds to information potentially useful to explain and make understandable the region as well interaction with adjoining regions, okay? Manage a region by the local authority, by means of some decision support system in the spirit of territorial intelligence. Um, monitor its daily development through feedbacks and adaptation, simulate the future and design novel projects orient actions for the future. Why is regional knowledge difficult to be represented? The first is that the existence of several levels of governance and decision-making levels, state, region, cities, and say imply different knowledge bundles, possibly with discrepancies in view to potential, to potential or real contradiction. In addition, Whereas in business intelligence, knowledge is overall represented with logic, we face the difficulty of representing space. This is more logic, no more logic reasoning, but also geometric reasoning. For example, when we want to create a, a new a new road, okay, or create a new a new building, there are some aspects of geometric reasoning. Origin of regional knowledge. We can have written documents, such as books, expert reports, juridical documents, historic cartography, maps, images, including satellite images, aerial photos, and more recently, drone photos and videos. Knowledge can come from experts, people, various stakeholders, activists, associations, as witnesses or participants recording their contribution in various formats, such as forms, video, audios, and so on. Text and data and text mining from various repositories of big data and big streams. For example, analyzing Twitter messages to obtain a recent even information. Internet of objects, of I think, sorry, data from cellular phones, Wi-Fi connection, in situ centers for climate air pollution monitoring and for traffic monitoring and public board and, and cars. Dedicated components of knowledge collected for smart city. It, it means, it, it, I want to mean that we have knowledge in the city belonging to a region, okay? But sometimes this knowledge must be simplified, okay, to, to, be, to be useful for a, a region. And social media and so on. This is an example of a structure of a knowledge, geographic knowledge base. 
a knowledge base is, is organized around geographic rules. We have geographic objects, okay? For example, a road, a cities, uh, uh, rivers, uh, building, uh, park, uh, and so on. Geographic relations, especially topological relations, uh, containing, uh, uh, containing inside, uh, um, and so on. Geographic ontologies, this is the organization of all the, the classes of objects, for example, to distinguish in buildings, to distinguish uh, industries uh, and houses, okay? Physical mathematical models, and this is very important, for example, in uh, simulation. For example, when we have to, to deal with the disaster management, and, and especially floods management for for modeling evolution of the water levels we need some physical mathematical models and so we need to use those mathematical this physical mathematical modules in our system we have also a gazetteer a gazetteer is a, 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 a list of place names toponyms okay or the name of the of the series, uh, uh, names of uh, precincts, uh, of uh, places, and so on. And also external knowledge. Okay, I will explain you more uh, ex regarding ex external knowledge. For example, for a, a listed document, you know, in in a, in a lot of countries, it's forbidden to construct a new building. Uh, uh, in a you know within a, a buffer of for example 100 meters okay so this is an example okay uh, somebody uh, wanting to pre pre present uh, uh, a building you know and it must be disjoint okay of the or all the, the buffer this is a, an example of a rule okay in which we we have uh, um uh, examples of uh, of geometry uh, and topology, which is used uh, in uh, in uh, logic. External knowledge. We have when we have a region, we can have internal knowledge. I mean, inside the region regarding uh, agriculture, biodiversity, and so on. We, we have external neighboring knowledge as the vicinity. A vicinity. The reason is as follows. When a region make a decision, this decision can be influenced on other regions. Okay. But in reverse, decision made by adjoining or neighboring regions can have influence evolution of of your region, okay? And we have external outside knowledge. This is for, uh, uh, for uh, technological watching. For each region, there is a, a, a service in charge of technology, technological watching, you know, exp analyzing experiences made in some other places in order to, to, to to examine the whether they can be used in uh, our uh, okay, and for that research and practice, but we can have some uh, information. We have uh, with several colleagues, we we, we are uh, we are publishing a book, you know, uh, which is um, by Springer Verlag, and this book will be um, available uh, next uh, uh, within a few weeks. Uh, as you know, United Nations have um, decided a program with 17 sustainable development goals. Oh, and it, 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 uh, they have decided that everywhere in the world, uh, every, every local authority must, uh, must um, let me say, uh, apply those goals. And we can see in the list that they can, okay. Goal number one, 
no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, gender e equality, clean water, sanitation. Well, we, we, you can see that all those uh, goals can have uh, can be used, can be possible regional levels. You know, some of them totally, some of them partially, and I, I have no time to, to to give more explanation. The research agenda. Okay, so we have uh, identified. We were um, in, in the uh, brainstorm workshop. Uh, we were around twenty persons. Okay, and we have identified. 39 research lines, okay, in knowledge management, political sciences, and sociology. And the research question, around 100 research questions have been identified, pot potentially leading to more than 100 PhD dissertations. The content, first, unveiling characteristic of regional knowledge, and second, governance. So uh, I will give you the list, the list of those uh, lines. Uh, uh, here, I have no time to explain everything, but uh, for each line, I, I can give um, details, a lot of details. First, special temporal knowledge. One of the problem is to deal with space, okay? Coordinates, uh, uh, geometry, computational geometry, and now I think that more or less we are uh, able to integrate geometry in in um, in, uh, in logic. Regarding temp times, times this is a little bit uh, this is different. Uh, for those who are aware about the problem of, of managing time in 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 database systems, you know that we have different uh, meaning for times. It could be for political actions, you know? The basis is more or less uh, a month, uh, uh, a year. Okay? But regarding sensors, sensor, sensor, they can send information every minutes, okay? Or every second. Regarding the landscapes, the evolution in landscapes, this is a geological time. And you know, geological time, we have era with uh, million or billion of years. Okay, and this is a fuzzy. You know, this is also, okay. Now, fuzzy knowledge and rules. Um, I, I was speaking about uh, fuzzy regions, but we have also, um, uh, first, if, for example, a river. A river, we, we can, uh, depending of the level of water, we can have a minor bed and the major bed. The major bed is when you have uh, floods. Minor beds is sometimes it could be no water at all in the Rio Seco. Okay. And for rules, you know, you we can define some fuzzy rules. Uh, yes, a tier and places with fuzzy geometries. The problem is not is not to to define those uh, geometries, those uh, fuzzy geometries, but also to integrate them in rules. Ontologies. <clears throat> we have uh, uh, we have several uh, geographic ontologies, but we need to apply them at regional level. Rule super seeding. In some places, you know, uh, in, in some countries, you have national uh, roads and we have local roads. In some countries, local roads are more important than national roads. In, in this case, the national roads is no more applied, but you are using local roads. And so, we have diff a lot of different situations regarding is a is a level of rules and how they can uh, supersede each other. Scalability of regional knowledge, you know, knowledge for uh, 
we, we can have cities, we can have towns, we can have sub regions, and sometimes it's interesting to to to, to have a sort of construction, a sort of hierarchical, hierarchical sorry, construction of knowledge. Uh, the border effects, okay, okay. Uh, as I told you, decision made elsewhere can affect the evolution of a city, and vice versa. Natural continuous phenomena. And here it's for, uh, for example, for uh, I was speaking about floods, but air pollution, you know. And for those who uh, know about those phenomena, those phenomena, okay, remember that we have to use the differential equations, differential equation. So the problem is how to make to mix logic and uh, differential equations, you know, and this is a barrier we have to overcome. Locally embodied information, past rules for rules. For example, uh, historical buildings, you know, historical buildings were made with past rules, okay? And now we have new rules, for example, uh, uh, regarding buildings, you know? You you cannot accept to, to demolish a, a, an historical building because it was not following the, the, the actual rule, but it was designed uh, with past rules. Exploitation of this knowledge from urban analytics to regional analytics. This is uh, big data. Feed forward knowledge. Okay, I, I will explain it. Uh, uh, regarding feed forward knowledge, quality of knowledge, knowledge visualization and sharing for reasoning, dashboard for real time monitoring, case based uh, reasoning. Cross border regional continuity and regional integration. Here, we, here this is a problem of interoperability. It, and you know, uh, Myself, I was working a lot on, on interoperability of geographic uh, databases. And here, and here's a problem of interoperability, interoperability of uh, uh, knowledge base is, is much more uh, complex. And we need to define uh, reason, reasoning engines. For example, when we, you, we have a plant, where to construct a new hospital, where to construct a new, a new motorway, uh, we we are applying rules. Rules, those rules are applied on objects, and we need some reasoning engine. By reasoning engine, I mean uh, engine integrating non non only not only uh, rules logic, okay, but computational geometry, topology, operation research. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, continuous uh, differential equations and so on. Transparency and explicability. When you are dealing with citizens, you need always to give explanations, you know? When he, yes, I, I am aware by deep learning, we can find some decision. Okay, we we have a situation by deep learning, we can propose something. But in this case, there is a problem of explanation. And you know, one of the problems in, in deep learning is that it's very difficult to, to, to get information. Extracting knowledge and rules from written documents. Regional knowledge and leaks we SDI is special data infrastructure. All countries are are asked to organize a sort of uh, a special uh, an infrastructure regard, uh, regarding uh, 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 data structure um, dealing with uh, all kind of data. So problem of indexing, indexing, and this is very very complex. You know how to index knowledge. 
knowledge curation and removal of fake knowledge. You know, and fake knowledge is it is not so easy to detect and to to remove. <clears throat> Now regarding governance and decision making, a uh, problem of privacy, ownership, jurisdiction, and rule inception. You know, each region can can define some rules. You know, and so this is uh, new rules. Uh, Combining how to combine AI based collective and knowledge intelligence. Okay, it's mixing intelligence of people and intelligence of uh, computers. Formation of a team of professional citizen empowerment. Perhaps you are not very. This is not very clear for for you. Citizen empowerment is how to give power to citizens. First level, this is how to take into account their opinion in new uh, projects. Decision making rules. Uh, more difficult is lesson learned from accepted and abandoned projects. Even if you decide not to continue a project, to abandon a project, some lessons can be extracted, you know, and it's it could be interesting. Digital twins for regions. There are a lot of uh, examples in smart cities regarding digital twins for cities, but as far as I know, there are no experimentation regarding uh, regions. Border effects, unexpected outcomes. Use of knowledge to boost economy innovation, cost and enforcing rules, technological and sociological watching. Uh, after this very uh, rapid presentation of all research lines, I have decided to present you in, in a little bit more detail uh, three aspects. The problem of superseding rules, uh, natural phenomena, case-based reasoning, and feed-forward rules. Okay. Uh, is the northern hemisphere. Usually when you are going north, it's colder, but there are exceptions. Moreover, from a legal point of view, what was decided well in one place may be wrong in higher place or vice versa. In other words, in some places, specific rules may surpass, may supersede general rules or vice versa. In identify application where overcoming is important. What can be the guidelines to manage overcoming? Overcoming or is the same thing. What are the connection to the correction of rules? You know, and it means um, a possibility in the reasoning. We, we can disable or enable some rules in some places, you know, and what could be when you are disabling a rule in some place, you can, because there are some secondary rules, you can have some problems regarding the rules. Natural uh, phenomena. As I told you, uh, floods, pollutants, pressure, winds, the lava flows are usually modeled by continuous fields. And in some cases, by differential equations. Okay. <clears throat> How to practically model those phenomena in a given place? Here we know, usually, we we have system for for uh, for floods, you know, but you know this is uh, uh, big programs, but they are not in integrated in in uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, systems. Um, 
and, and, and the problem of, of sensors. Sensor, for example, regarding floods, we have a, a sensor me measuring the level of water in, in a river. Okay, and in some times we can have some alerts and after we, uh, we can um, we can run some some um, some forecasting maps. Case based uh, reasoning. I, I think you are aware about case based reasoning. You know, in case based reasoning, we have the description of cases. Okay, and we have a new uh, in the description of cases. There are two parts, the description of the case and the solution as the adapted solution. When you have a new case, we are searching in the repository of cases to see whether a case can be, uh, a solution can be imported. For, for a mathematical point of view, in this case, we have a sort of of um, multi-dimensional place uh, system, multi-dimensional system in which we have some points, and we are we are looking for the nearest points points in this uh, space. Okay, but here it's more difficult. For example, um, how to to when you have the terrain of a region, the terrain of a region in which we have some, some valleys, some hills, some mountains, some plains, you know. And here and in a play, in a region, they have adopted a situation. But we have another region. Okay. And the region have, usually they don't have the same um, profile. Usually Sub some sub region can have same profile or some other sub regions. Okay, and so it's how to compare uh, those um, situations. <clears throat> Proposed model to describe the geographic characteristic of a case. Select criteria to evaluate uh, the actions. Uh, now, feed forward rules. Let us consider two rules. If it rains, I get wet. If it rains, I take my umbrella. Okay. In a very elementary books or courses in artificial intelligence, you are using those two rules. Okay. But in reality, they are very difficult. difficult. It's the first one is a natural consequence. Okay. But the second is more complex. Since it is often, it often rains in, in, I have decided to buy an umbrella. And so if I have an umbrella, I will use it. So it's an anticipatory decision and we call it a feed forward rule. It means the first one could be seen a sort of Feedback rule as a consequence. Okay. Feedback control system. You know, is this a regulation taking the past into consideration? Okay. And we call it in some places ex post. Feed forward control system. Regulation taking the future into consideration. For example, uh, all the decision regarding the the climate change, you know, since apparently there were no nothing in the past, you know, we have we have a lot of fit forward uh, rules. The fit forward rules can be used to boost knowledge economy, education, okay, and assist policy makers. And I will take an example in disaster management. And, and, and so the research question is, can feed forward rules dedicated to regional policy making be identified and semantically characterized? Okay. 
this is an example, you know, this is the classical organization of, um, of disaster management. First, for example, it could be floods, it could be tsunamis, it could be volcano eruption, uh, and so on. Mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery. And, and the problem is, we know that a hazard will, will occur. And so we need to prepare. Mitigation, this is a very long term. Preparedness, this is, uh, let me say, in, a, in a days or weeks before the occurring of hazard. Um, response, discovery. Okay. And, uh, and here, um, conclusions. It's important regional planning. In a lot of places, it's very important to have uh, to organize uh, local authorities, the roles of local authorities and regional authorities, this is to make uh, regional planning. We knowledge management can be interesting, but as I told you, right now there are few exper experiences, few experimentation. They are experimentation at the level of cities, but practically nothing at the level of region. We have designed a research agenda with several colleagues, around 40 research lines, and um, more than 100 page this subject. If among you, there are some PhD tutors in artificial intelligence who have no ideas how to 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 organize their research okay we can give you a lot of ideas okay the <clears throat> here is a, the main person we who have uh, um, worked for the research agenda uh, uh, myself peter nakon from the netherlands gloria bordonia from italy Kelly Marcoutit, also from the Zealand, <coughs> Fabien Duchateau, Antonio Rinaldi, <coughs> Michael Mehafi, and Boccolo Anthony from Norway. Okay, so thanks a lot for your presentation. As I told you at the beginning, you can download this presentation here as you have seen. You were. And now, um, um, so I am ready for, for questions. Hello. Thank you so much, Robert, for your presentation. We have about 10 minutes for, for questions. I would like to start with a couple of questions, Robert. Can you hear yeah. me, Robert? Yeah, yeah, OK. OK, perfect. Thank you. OK. What is it, what is it possible to have a gallery of people? Sorry? Okay. Can you is it possible to have the gallery of people, the okay. picture of all people? There are 35 participants. Okay. Is it possible to, to, to see them? Okay. Yeah, well, let me, let me give you my, my question, right? Um, you, you talk about an agenda, a research agenda, which is very, very interesting. And actually, I think it fits perfectly with this conference. We are now here in Peru, but you know that uh, in this conference, there are a lot of Latin American people, for example. And you mentioned that you proposed in this agenda 39 research topics. And these topics uh, could lead uh, more than 100 uh, PhD projects. So my question is, uh, how can we I mean, Latin American universities, Latin American, American researchers, how can we join to this agenda in order to uh, get new opportunities for contributions, new opportunities for mobility, for example, and so on? Oh, well, um, two possibilities. The first one is to, to buy the book, <laughs> okay? And it, it will be 
uh, available, I think, in the next beginning of November. This is one aspect. The second is, you know, this is not so 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 simple, you know, to, to organize. Perhaps a, a possibility could to, could be to organize a, a seminar <clears throat> in um, in Latin America regarding this kind of thing. Uh, since I'm speaking uh, Spanish, I can organize it in in, in Spanish uh, very easily. So if you or some other people are interested, you know we can we can organize a, a sort of seminar, uh, developing the ideas regarding the projects, and uh, you know, I I don't want to say it could be one one full week. But uh, I think uh, two or three days could be interesting because uh, I, I think the possibility is, is to 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 present the agenda, and I think the participants uh, can have some ideas and to develop their ideas, and uh, to to and the idea is for each part to to write of uh, a PhD topic topics you know. And this PhD topic could be presented to to potential uh, PhD candidates. Okay, this is my proposition. All right, thank you. That, that, that's that's nice. That's nice. Actually, yesterday we had a keynote speaker who is from Peru. He is Walter Curioso, and he uh, showed us uh, a very nice framework for health services. So uh, you say that uh, we can arrange let's say a meeting for, I don't know, let's say presenting different ideas in order to be able to join this agenda. So that's that's quite good. And I really appreciate it because also in this conference we have, uh, we have gotten several good research results and then we could, we could share this, this knowledge with, with you and with your colleagues. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, maybe okay. so oh, many oh, oh, like I, I will be uh, I will be in Quito um in, in February. Sorry? I will be in Ecuador in Quito in, in February. That, that's that's cool. That's cool. Uh, maybe we it's can make something here. If you are here in Ecuador, so you are here in Latin America, it will be easier to us. Uh, for, I don't know, making some uh, activities. Mm -hmm. so that's, okay. that's really nice, thanks. So, someone would like to make any question in the audience? I don't know if someone in, in the Zoom uh, would like to make any question. No. Uh, Florencia, give me a second, Pueden ser dadas en, uh, en español. Uh, okay, Robert, Robert speaks Spanish, so if someone would like to make a question in Spanish, uh, Robert is very happy to answer. Hi, uh, thank you for, for, for your uh, exposition, it's so interesting. Uh, my, my question, you talk about Twin Cities. Uh, mm -hmm. What's happened with that? Do you think it's probably that uh, one city from Europe can be similar to to? No, 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 no. This is twin cities, a twin digital cities. Okay, no, no, it's not uh, two uh, ciudad de hermanas. No, 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 no. And uh, uh, is you have a city, and you have a, a, a digital twin. Of a city, okay. It means you you, you have a sort of a, a comprehensive model of the city. Do you see what I mean? Perfect. I understand. Thank you so much. Okay. So so the idea is is to have a digital twin for a, a region. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So someone else would like to make a question. Uh, Robert, could you please turn on your camera in order to to know you? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, but, but uh, uh, it's impossible. Okay, yeah. Okay, we can yeah, we yeah. can see you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. 
So someone else would like to make a question? Well, actually, we are just in time, so if there is no more questions, uh, finally, thank you so much, Robert, for sharing your, your ideas, your, your experience, your projects. Thank you so much for this presentation. And we are very happy to, to have you here in this conference as keynote speaker. So thank you so much. And I would like to invite everyone to join the next session of the conference. Thank you. Okay. So bye-bye, everyone. Okay. You have my email address, so you can join me if uh, necessary. Perfect. Okay. 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 Uh, so we finished this session. And in five minutes, we start the next sessions. Uh, remember, we have one session here in the, in the auditorium, and we have another session in the room 201. Thank you so much.
that the people that presents is either here presentially or is online. Could you, could you, be, could you make sure that the people over there is listening to us? People online, are they listening? Okay, so the first presentation is, known, is entitled as classifying incoming customer message for an e-commerce site using supervised learning. The authors are Misael Andre Albañil Sanchez and Ixen Galpin. Ixen, is it, are you here? Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna open the screen for you, Javier, and the screen is all yours now. Javier, uh, let us know if you are having any issue. Don't worry, take your time. I'm, I'm gonna keep talking to the audience here. Most of the audience over here speak Spanish, but I'm gonna keep in English because over there, people don't understand Spanish. Today we are gonna have a very, very nice session because it includes a lot of machine learning and also applications in medicine and some IOT as well. Also, COVID-19, which is authored by our fellow over here. And it's an excellent presentation. I got a high expectation because it's, it's a view from abroad. And well, I put a, I put a lot of load on you, <laughs> but that will be nice. Um, unfortunately, do, do we have the translation for the students? Any students speaking English? Algunos de ustedes habla inglés? Okay, so I'm going to ask the people to speak slowly so you can catch most of the information that is going to be given here. Do you understand my English? Do you? ¿Ustedes entienden mi inglés? If I speak slow, can you get it? Okay, no, el muchacho está... Okay, um, talking to the internet audience now, uh, we would like to know if the authors of classifying incoming customer messages for an e-commerce site using supervised learning, is any of the authors here? That work is authored by Misael Andre Albañil Sanchez and Ixen Galpin. May I say Galpan? That's a French last name. Okay, so we're gonna go over the first presentation. Now I'm talking about the second presentation, which is called Comparison of Machine Learning Models for Predicting Rainfall in Tropical Regions. The Colombian case. Is it any author of this work present here online? I'm gonna name the authors. Carlos Andres, Rocha Ruiz, Olmer Garcia Bedoya, Ixen Galpin. Any of the authors here? Okay, Carlos, we can read you now. Let me know if you are ready so we can open the system for your presentation. Are you ready? Excellent, go ahead. The screen is all yours. The audience here is watching you.
Can you try now, Carlos? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Andres Rocha. I'm from Colombia. Uh, I don't know, uh, the, the presentation will be in English or in Spanish? The, but I, I call in the two ways. Carlos, we have to do it in English because we have some audience that doesn't speak Spanish. But I'm going to ask you to go very slow because we have a group of students here and they are willing to know what you want to say. Great, great. So let me show you my screen. Great. Can you see my screen? Uh, Carlos, uh, give me a second, Carlos. I'm going to give some important message. The great. translation is working. You know, we have a live translation. So you can speak in English slowly, and the translator is going to work from English to Spanish. But I okay. can please do it very, very slow. OK, OK, I get it. So uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, my name is Andres Rocha. Uh, I'm from the Tadeos University in Bogota. That's my. My paper, it's predicting the rainfall using machine learning models in tropical regions. Uh, base, uh, we use the Colombian case. Basically, we try to combine the, the purpose of machine learning and the, the things we could make with machine learning with the importance of getting some tools or send a toolkit to agricultural people, to, 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 to farmers, to get some important, uh, to, to get some important tool to, to make the decision for the future. So this is basically a, a, a study of how could I uh, predict the rainfall or the, 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 the periods of rainfall in the long term. I don't care the, the short term. I'm trying to predict uh, what we're going to happen with the rainfall in the next month and what's going to happen with the rainfall in the long term. Why is important? Because basically the long-term decisions about the rainfall could be useful for the farmers uh, to make their own decisions. For example, uh, I don't know if in the future as a potato farmer, uh, I, I don't know in the future we're going to be uh, 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 going to be a high rainfall, uh, high levels of rainfall, or we're going to be a lowest le levels of rainfall. So it's useful for me as a potato farmer know what's going to happen with the weather and what's going to happen with the rainfall in the future. It lets uh, we're going to discuss about what is the importance of the of the study what we made for the study and what is the limitation of the study. So uh, TITS could be a really very important asset for different farmers. And it's important for the Colombia, in Colombian case particularly because the Colombia economy is based, uh, it's, it's uh, majority, the, the majority is based in agricultural economy. It's a Third, it's a first, first part economy. So it's very important to to a great part of the population in Colombia to know to 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 have tools to understand how could be easier for me as a farmer to how to how to improve my 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 production. So. It's very important for the farmer and it's very important for the state because based on that information and based on the predictions, I could, as a state, I could make a, a schedule of agricultural insurance to say, okay, if in the future it's a probability, a great probability of uh, the increase of rainfall in, in a specific months, uh, could be useful for for me to insurance that production of any any agricultural 
uh, good. So it's 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 good for me as a as a farmer as a as a state uh, how to how to know the uh, try to predict the future and now how what is what is the probability of of that basically uh, in the literature review we made a, a complete literature and we found several things most of the models are created as a physical models so in the machine learning, there exists uh, some models uh, trying to predict the rainfall, but the most of the models uh, in the in, in, in that topic in trying to predict the weather are physical models, physics models. I'm sorry, <laughs> not physical physics. So the, the the major problem is the that physics models are really hard to to compute are really hard to, to, to make a prediction uh, with that because there are a lot of variables and a lot of, uh, it's, it's a really complex model to compute and it's not easier for a farmer or a, a small farmer to have uh, that, that tool. So that's the importance of the machine learning here. And that's the reason why I'm thinking the machine learning could be useful for the farmers and the small producer. producer. We made some statistical models and machine and what the, what had been done with machine learning models in uh, weather forecasting. Where has been has made weather forecasting in the in in another papers basically has been made in other regions but not in the tropic. It's really difficult to predict the tropic because the weather in the tropic are very unpredictable so how to say it so in the north in hemisphere and the south hemisphere it's a little bit easier because there exists seasons here in colombia doesn't exist season so it's it's really difficult for that and the most of the studies are focused in the regions that exist season so that's that's the reason which techniques have been used? Basically, most of the techniques it's in physics models and some machine learning models, but based mostly in the seasonal regions. That exists high computational resources that uh, in the compute to compute the physics models. Uh, it's it, uh, spent a lot of computational resources, so that's one of the conclusion of the literature review. Uh, variables the, the most you the, the most common variable to use to forecast uh, the weather uh, is the rainfall but also the temperature also the air precipitation also the humidity so it's there is exists a lot of variables to use for try to forecast the weather but in this study, you only use the the rainfall the rainfall precipitation the, the precipitation actually. So, for the data understanding, where we going to where we're going to where we get data, we get the data for the IDEAM. IDEAM is like an institution in the Colombian government to to cover the all the. Uh, weather me uh, measures and all the uh, statistics and the analysis around the weather in Colombia. So that, that's the where we get the data. Uh, we made some uh, studies, uh, descriptive statistics, uh, some tests of the uh, of the of the data, and we're going to describe the problem. So basically, we get more or less two thousand. Uh, stations, uh, weather the stations around Colombia, but the distribution of the of those stations are not the same, so are not uniform. In this map, we can see the distribution of those stations uh, are basically in the north of Colombia. The Amazon are not covered by the IDEAM, and we are not going to. We are not made the stations and the, the the analysis on those on those regions that's that's a limitation because the colombian weather are very 
different in different regions. So it depends on the regions and depends on the the altitude and depends on every, some uh, very variables. Yeah, and we basically get half of the of the country. So it, that's a limitation, but uh, there is not possible to get data right there because it's basically a jungle. Some of the some of the descriptive statistics are we are here is the rainfall levels across the years uh, since 19, uh, 1900 until now until 2018 if I if I cannot remember it's basically with the, the conclusion of that graph of the flood it's basically the rainfall levels are increasing over the years are increasing there, there exists a incre uh, increase of rainfall over the years in in, in average in Colombian in Colombia that could be uh, that, that, that could be uh, a normal or uh, that, that, uh, specific um, nor normal conclusion but or, or a normal I don't know how to say, I'm sorry, a normal attitude, a normal performance in the world, around the world. But uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a little, uh, it, it's, 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 it's different, it, 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 it's equal in Colombia. So in, in Colombia, in, 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 over the years are increasing the rainfall. If we see as a month, uh, seasonal events, we could see in August or more or less in July uh, increase the, the 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 rainfall levels across in average, of course, across the all the stations. So maybe uh, th thinking about that, we could see the in in August more or less in July from July to August is easier to it, it, it's major probability of get higher levels of of of, of rainbow across the across the year and if we see as a altitude uh, the altitude against the rainfall levels it's not too much clear but we can see a little uh, a little trend about the highest level of a uh, highest uh, altitude in, in in the country makes a highest level of a uh, shorten level of or of, of, of rainbow so uh, the places where really high are going to be uh, a, a little more dry in the, in the weather we made some specific uh, test into, I, I see a hand raise it. I'm sorry. In the in the teams in the in the. Okay. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. We we will okay. set the questions at the end of your presentation. Okay. Okay. This is basically a time series problem. Why? Because we get the data from the beginning from the from, from the. To, uh, from the beginning of the of, of, of the of the data in the across the time until 2018 of each times of the, each station so each stations could be represented as a time series or as a yeah, as a time series of the rainfall level so basically we have a time series problem one of the most popular tests in time series are the dicky filler test the dicky filler test trying to measure the type of the time series. So there exist different types of the time series, but the, the most common type type is the random walk. The random walk, it's like the most difficult kind of theory to try to predict because you actually don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you have to make some special things to try to predict it. And this uh, test try to identify what kind of uh, what kind of series is that time series. So a random work is like a stock prices uh, plot. I don't know if you are saying that plot, but that's basically a random work. And the 
where uh, are basically a random work. That's the first conclusion of that uh, of that table. The mostly of the uh, of the series or mostly of the yeah the, the series uh, the measure of the stations, we can conclude uh, there are random walk without drift and trend. So that could be a problem because we have to make some special things to, to try to predict that. They, they could be made and it, it's 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 it, it, it's a special treatment to, to try to predict that. So in the data preparation, uh, after we get the data, uh, we try we clean in, we structure and we split. And I'm going to try the logical uh, pipeline to try to predict the, for, the forecast and not to create the single model for each station and just create a meta model across all the station, across all the time. So uh, as a time series model, as you say, there exists more than 2000 uh, time series. So basically one, uh, one approach could be try to create a model isolated for the other time series. So basically across 2000, uh, uh, above 2000 uh, time series models, but doesn't make sense. So we try to change a little bit the our, mean, our, our thinking and I'm going to explain that. First of all, we, we move, or we restructure the time series as a, a specific time series, as a copy of the time series, but that allows me to create a, a supervised learning model uh, in order to create, uh, in order to to put a, a data up, uh, one above other another and create a, all a uh, master table to 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 try to predict the the the, the each, each station based on first uh, the time and second one the the kind of the station the, the the type of the station. So first the the the, the, the time series. Are creating the x, x, xt, xt minus one, xt minus two, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and basically we create uh, uh, several copies of that of, of that time series, just lagging one by one the, the 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 time series. So that's the approach we take, and this approach is uh, very useful and very popular as in a in a text processing model. So as basically we take the text processing models and the language processing models and try to adapt it to the to the problem, to this problem. When once we get the data just later, we just try to predict the next steps in the in the data. So if we get uh, x x sub zero, x sub one, x sub two, if so, et cetera, et cetera, we try to predict the next steps in, in each of the other of press. That allows me to create uh, supervised learning models and try to experiment and, 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 and try to make a lot of uh, supervised learning models like super, uh, super vector machine, random forest, even a neural, a neural network. That's some of the results. Uh, we don't calculate for all the for, for, for all the types of the of the time series. We don't calculate one each one one by one. We just try to take a a, a part of the of the series, a representative part of the series, and try to predict that. That's a little uh, a little view of that, and. That, that, that's not the model. That's basically the separation across the the trend and the seasonal events. If you see that every single time series have a seasonal events, and we try to predict the the seasonal the the trend the the trend part of the time series. That's that, that's the approach we take. In the results, we create uh, several models, evaluate the models. We took the best models and we take we took the best model prediction. 
basically, as we are talking about the rainfall levels, we are trying to predict in a, a regression problem. We have a regression problem and trying to predict that what's going to be the next step in the rainfall level. So uh, it is a continuous problem. So it's a, it's a regression problem. As a regression problem, we take the, the uh, I, I can't remember the name, I'm sorry. The R is M E, I, I, I can't remember. R is M E, uh, measure to, to see, to, to compare each of the, of, of the models as uh, uh, in, in, in across the station. So we take just six stations in decision tree, um, uh, key and N, linear, linear models, just a, a linear, a, a regression linear, LSTM, that's uh, basically a, a neural networks uh, based on, 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 on uh, a neural networks that works very, very good in time series, random forest, super vector machine, and exibus. The bold numbers are the best part of the, the best the best model across the station. So in the first one is the decision decision tree, the second one, the support vector machine, the third one, support vector machine. As you see, the best, the, the mostly of the models that we, we, we understand is the, the support vector machine. And across the, across the, across the, 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 the estimations. I'm sorry. Okay. And that's the prediction of outside of the uh, of the data. Uh, that's a prediction outside of the data. And what is the performance of the model outside of the data? So in the random forest, the super vector machine, the, the best the best model in one of the those stations, uh, the best model found in one of those stations. Uh, that's the prediction of uh, the the next uh, in uh, outside of the data. So. Sometimes the, the the prediction could be not better enough. I don't know, but that sometimes the prediction really feel to the actual 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 number. So the most of the times uh, the prediction uh, the, the depends on the time of the, the type of the series and depends of the station we are going to look in uh, could be a better performance or the or not too much good performance so depends uh, that, that that prediction depends a lot of the type of the series and depends a lot of, of the type of the region you are looking for uh, the best the best model is basically in that series uh, that, that really feels a lot of uh, very good in that in that uh, in that prediction, and that's a, a little model evaluation about uh, around the LSTM in other samples. So that's we made basically with that we made right here is we took a model a LSTM model that we calculate, and with that model, with in a specific time series, we try to predict another time series. That's the basically the, the the that what is the performance or we're trying to see what is the performance of that model, trying to get the from one model to try to predict another another time series. The green the green the uh, the green the green line, it's the prediction and this uh, blue line are the actual values. So in the prediction we can see in one of these project in one of the of these lines on the, of these of, of this series series we see the model actually feels very good in the trend but not very good in the that at in at topics and at, uh, that that in the peaks and the and the um, and the the that 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 that, that times that they were could be very hard to 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 predict so really feels really good in the trend but not in the, in the other so if we are going to try to predict the trend in the long term we are 
very we have a powerful tool but we cannot to try to predict the that that periods that it's carlos. really hard to predict carlos sorry to interrupt yes. you we have more we have two minutes more because we allocated okay. like six presentations in two hours and now we're yep. running just in time okay okay yeah just left the discussion uh, so that that's not the best <laughs> the best model to call, could be made basically because the there left a lot of data but could be a scalability model because uh, it's easier to 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 perform it's easier to to scale and it's easier to 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 use so could be a really good tool for a public policy around the 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 agricultural farmers and the agricultural people to 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 take one tool to call help very helpful for for that first of all the conclusion is a uh, rainfall forecast in tropical regions are, are very a little bit hard than uh, in other regions and could be helpful for the agricultural economies and the first of uh, the, the the key of the of the conclusion is time series forecasting depends a lot of the kind of the series, depends a lot of the quite, what kind of the series, what kind of the of the region we're looking for, we're talking about, and that's basically that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos, for the presentation. It was very clear. Um, I'm going to open the space for the questions. The questions might be proposed in any language spoken by the people in the room. So, well, let's go ahead. Alguna pregunta? No questions? Over here, questions? Professor? Hi, well, very good, very interesting work, Carlos. Uh, congratulations. It's a good presentation too. I want to know if it's a, your a, it's your work for your magister, your work of your degree, or it's a line of research. Yeah, that was actually part of my work. I, I was working in the National Planning Department uh, in the 2019, so it was part of my work and part of my master's degree thesis, so. Uh, it's that, part of your thesis. Well, thank yeah, you, that, that, congratulations, that's... and continue working. Thank you. Carlos, I got a couple of questions for you. The first Great. one, when you work with those machine learning models that include a time series, very often you don't have a square matrices. So you have to do padding, or you have to add zeros. How do you, how do you accomplish the square of your matrix? How do you make it a square? The square of the matrix? I, I, will, I, will, I, I will say in Spanish. Yeah. Cuando estás trabajando con esas eh, series de tiempo, resulta que la estación 1 no te entrega la misma cantidad de tiempos o de, de puntos que la estación 2. Mm. ¿Cómo yeah. hiciste? Pero, pero yeah. aún así los modelos de inteligencia artificial te, te, te exigen que tu matriz de factores sean cuadradas, perfectamente cuadradas, bueno, rectangulares. Sí. ¿Cómo hiciste para llenar los otros espacios? ¿Qué hiciste para que te diera eso? Ok, entiendo. Voy a responder en español. Eh, sí, sí, ese fue un problema, olvidé decirlo. Básicamente, tuvimos que triangular la información. Entonces, tomamos las estaciones más cercanas eh, a ese punto en blanco y triangulamos la información basadas en esas estaciones más cercanas. Evidentemente, eso generaría un poco un cierto nivel de incertidumbre en los series de datos, pero pues era como la opción más, más, más cercana. Tuvimos en cuenta la altitud para hacer esa triangulación y tuvimos en cuenta pues, los niveles de, de, de lluvia. Ok, thank you so much. Very clear. Um, most of the authors do something similar, you know, they recreate the data and they just push it in the matrix. Um, my other question is, why are you doing this? Um, what is the application that it has? I'm thinking about the farmer trying to understand how he is going to increase production. You know, the kind of farmers that we have. How, yeah. how, 
have you thought about yeah. how you're going to approach to the farmer and say, listen, now you have artificial intelligence and you can use it for your benefit? How are you going to accomplish that? First of all, okay. As I mentioned, that begins in a national planning department. That's the ministry in Colombia about uh, the, the planning, the, the pu public policy. And uh, as a first step, uh, is I create uh, an application that basically the inputs of that was the data, the AM data, and the output are the predictions. So in the first step could be uh, really useful for the government to, to see, okay, uh, based on that predictions, we could go to those to those regions and try to negotiate the ins on a kind of insurance or, or with a third party, of course, with uh, the, the, the private sector, a kind of insurance uh, to try to protect that production in the future because based on my model, uh, and uh, uh, I could see, okay, there could be a loss of the, I could, could make a loss of the production based on the rainfall levels. So in the first step, uh, the the first consumer of that of that model is the is the is the national planning department. But uh, we are appointed to can be used as a, an application in the future. Uh, for the normal people, so like a farmer or or or, or like uh, anyone to could be useful for that, could, that could use that information for anything. So, but that's more or less the the answer. Excellent, Carlos. Thank you so much. Just a suggestion: uh, when we work in software, we never limit the software. We never close it. And I'm telling you this because if you see the western part of Colombia. It's unprotected, and you know when when there is rain a lot of it. When when rains a lot over there, most of the streets and, and houses and bridges get destroyed. So it will be very nice to know the, your predictions over there in order to move in advance. Thank you so much. Uh, well, very nice presentation. I'm gonna call the next one. Next presentation Great. is comparison. Oh no, deep mining COVID-19 literature, presented by. Josh Gun Sis Hadi Sarsde Sirat Sare. My pronunciation is good, huh? <laughs> Thank you so much. Are you gonna use this one? Your cup? Let me explain something to you guys. Yeah. Just for the just for the people <laughs> solamente para las personas que eh, no lo han cogido todavía, o de pronto yo estoy hablando cosas locas aquí, díganmelo siempre, a mí me encanta la crítica. Este botoncito es para que escuchen la presentación en idioma nativo, nos la están entregando en castellano. Entonces, entren en sus celulares y la ponen aquí. No sé si ya lo sabían, um, pero si no lo sabían, porque los veo pegados del teléfono, pero jugando tricky, pasapalabra y todo eso. Ahí van a escuchar al compañero, él va a hablar en inglés, ¿cierto? ¿Estás hablando en inglés? English. Yeah. English. And the translation is going to work, especially here. Esto es una vista al COVID desde afuera, o sea que es muy interesante. Ok, muchas gracias. Let's go ahead. So, thank you very much. So, we will now set up the presentation so everyone can see it and then I will, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, is there like a, let me go for F5. Or, you know, like the presentation mode, if you go to, yeah, yeah, oh, perfect, perfect, this looks so good, looks much better. So my talk is going to be about mining of COVID-19 literature, um, and I am from the University of Luxembourg. Uh, Department of Computer Science and uh, this is work done together uh, with Pascal Bevry who is a professor in HPC actually high processing computers and with professor Christoph Schommer who is a professor for artificial intelligence so the idea to this project uh, came uh, around July 
uh, in 2020 after the pandemic hit the globe. And uh, then in our department, we had the discussion what we can do about the pandemic. So what computer science can contribute into the pandemic, how um, we can help there. So as you remember, 2020 March, uh, there was a lockdown. Um, so in uh, Luxembourg, every, everything was closed and people were sent home and we used to work from home, um, home offices. So, and our idea was, yeah, to uh, gather data uh, related to COVID-19 from different uh, sources and put it all together into one data warehouse. So this was the original idea. And with the idea, some other questions came, uh, which was uh, very interesting to, to, uh, to see. Um, yeah, so um, for that, actually, we took an extra server from the uh, servers of the university and set up um, frameworks. Uh, we set up a, a data, database, actually, uh, containing uh, all the data uh, we were gathering. And uh, another thing, of course, was also to analyze this data we were gathering and to visual visualize it. Uh, so this is just to, uh, yeah, to, to give you the background. And uh, actually what also happened in this year, 2020, uh, the National Fund in Luxembourg, which is called FNR, they were um, uh, actually financing uh, any project related to COVID-19. So uh, back then, uh, the pandemic was new. Uh, no one knew how to deal with it. Uh, so, um, and there was kind of also hype. People were applying for projects. Um, of course, many uh, people from the medicine department, from biology, life sciences, and so on. But there were also projects from uh, economics uh, um, regarding the impact of the uh, pandemic on, on the economics. And of course, some selected projects from computer scientists uh, like us. So, yeah, so, and what we did actually, uh, we started to look like to do research, what kind of data we can find on COVID-19. Uh, and our uh, scope was actually to go international uh, over the world. Uh, and at the end, we uh, focused on two uh, main data repositories or two main data sources. So um, the first data set, uh, what, what you see here is actually uh, yeah, about uh, the statistics about the uh, about the spread of the virus, about the uh, number of the cases, uh, about uh, people dying from the pandemic uh, from the virus, actually from COVID-19. So this was one uh, source we used. Actually, we we were uh, tapping into it and uh, yeah, tried kind of to use uh, uh, machine learning in order to predict uh, what. Uh, uh, is going to happen in the future, which is actually not easy thing to do, <laughs> because usually, as uh, as you know, um, this pandemic um, had uh, some idiosyncrasies, and it is uh, it was not that easy to predict predict what's going to happen, uh, especially the the policy, the local policies. Uh, for example, like in Luxembourg, like lockdown or um, trying to uh, make people to wear masks. Uh, so many de decisions had an impact of the spread of the virus. Uh, so, um, so that's why it's very, um, very uh, hard to predict actually from just bare data on the cases uh, what is going to happen the next day. So this is uh, our take on that. And there was another data source we were uh, focused at with the time. And this data set, actually, the idea of this, uh, uh, for this data set came from North America, actually from the States, from uh, Allen Institute for AI. 
uh, and then was uh, this, uh, the idea was supported by, uh, white, by the White House, by the University of Georgetown, and many other collaborators. And their idea was, let's uh, actually uh, gather every publication published about uh, COVID-19 uh, in English language. So, and actually this was also a brilliant idea because back then also in, in, the, in North America, governments would invest a lot of money into uh, developing vaccines, into, uh, uh, into study of uh, socioeconomic uh, impacts of the pandemic. Uh, but uh, no one was sure uh, how to share the results of all the research uh, which was, uh, has been carried out uh, about the pandemic. So that's why uh, this idea, which also was very, uh, yeah, very interesting for, uh, for us. Uh, okay, let's just gather, gather any publication in English language about COVID-19, and then we can kind of do analysis and see uh, what part is hype, you know, like what uh, people repeat actually uh, themselves, or is there indeed some novelty? You know, like are people indeed publishing something new about the pandemic? So this is, uh, this is why actually we came into this uh, second uh, data source. And this data, uh, data source is uh, open, open source. It has its special uh, license, uh, which is called Court 19 license, but basically it's free to download for everyone and to experiment. And I will dig deeper into this uh, data source, uh, which uh, we also described in our paper. Yeah. So, and uh, besides, we had also some additional data sources. Um, there, there was at our university a, a, a project which would uh, focus on tweets during, during the pandemic. And we had also uh, a collaboration with RTL, which is the biggest media company in Luxembourg. It's, uh, it stands for Radio Television Luxembourg. So, and they agreed also to give uh, their uh, user comments in their uh, in their web page during the pandemic for us uh, yeah to 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 look at so let's jump uh, to yeah what we did as as i mentioned we set up a server at the university of luxembourg we gathered and stored centrally this data on this uh, server we of course integrated the project uh, into uh, into teaching as well uh, the server can unfortunately be only accessed inside of university network. So this is actually the, uh, the, the link to it, but it cannot be uh, accessed from outside, unfortunately. So maybe we will one day be able to publish it to outside, but it's not the case uh, right now. Yeah, so uh, this data set, uh, called 19 from Allen Institute for AI, it is actually constantly growing. So, and you see here currently 35 gigs of pure text, which is not true, <laughs> actually, because meanwhile it has grown. Um, it is uh, actually now more than 70 gigs uh, of uh, data there. Uh, and if you, if you would download uh, the compressed version, the, the zip file, uh, you would get uh, like already to 15 up to 20 gigs of text. So th that's why uh, the, the, the main challenge was with the scale of this data set. So there was, uh, you cannot just open on your local computer this data set and look uh, in it. And if you even would look uh, in it, you wouldn't be able to read through it. So I think uh, uh, life of a human being won't be enough to read all these uh, all, all these papers, all these articles. Yeah. So, and here you see some statistics uh, regarding to time. Of course, the data set is gathered by the Allen University, uh, Allen Institute uh, in the States, and they, of course, also clean and add some metadata. But there were also some issues. Uh, because uh, they had also some, they were, they were like questions, should they gather also papers which are not directly uh, related to COVID-19, but 
to this corona family of viruses. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so that's why the, the lines are not that uh, hard, uh, actually. Yeah. And in some cases, also the papers uh, which were gathered, they don't have a publishing date, so they lack sometimes some metadata in order to know uh, what uh, are in them. So, uh, and lots of work has been done uh, about this data set. So uh, you see on the right hand, uh, actually uh, a link from Amazon, and Amazon said, okay, we would put uh, on our, uh, on, on Amazon Web Services, uh, we would put an information retrieval system where you can search, like keyword search for, for these publications. Yeah, and uh, there are many others uh, which are described actually in the paper. Yeah, and if you see on the left hand, this is just uh, uh, the, the, uh, the statistics, the, the list of journals uh, which are there, and you have there also like very fa famous journals like Nature or uh, Virology, and many, many others uh, which are actually very uh, yeah, famous in, in, in medicine, in life sciences where these old papers were published. So uh, now to give you a taste of the data set, uh, again, it's like a very big data set and even just reading the titles of the papers would take, uh, or analyzing them, uh, would take a lot of time. But what you see here is, uh, is the list of, uh, yeah, of the metadata. So each paper, uh, of course, has authors, like we know it, it has a title, it has uh, a publisher journal, journal, and it has also a, a time, a publishing time. So, and uh, what I did here, I just searched for the keyword pandemic in the title, and then this, yeah, this result uh, came. So, uh, or vaccine. So back then, also vaccines were developed and there, there was a big research going on uh, about the vaccines. So, and you could, yeah, uh, also uh, search for the keyword vaccine and get all the publications uh, about it. And uh, I will give you also a closer look. So what I did here, just uh, pick up one publication uh, and the data, what you need to know, is uh, stored in the JSON format. So it's uh, JSON and it has, uh, like you see here, it has, for example, an abstract. This would be the abstract of the paper. Uh, and uh, it has also body text. So, and this body text would be the main text of the paper. And of course, what we did we, uh, when we applied text mining to it, we, uh, yeah, uh, basically get rid all of other metadata and just kept, uh, yeah, the text uh, data we needed, uh, especially this body body text, which is the main uh, corpus of the of the papers. Um, yeah. So what should we do? Like this is a huge amount of publications, a uh, huge uh, corpus, and uh, of course our experience, our expertise was uh, in text mining. So we said, okay, let's, let's uh, go ahead and mine this, mine this data set. Um, but even uh, you will see, because the, the data set is so huge, determining the number of topics uh, is also a very hard thing to do. Uh, so the one thing, you need to imagine the topics I will give you uh, uh, an information, uh, just like squeezing the text, right? So if you don't wanna read the whole corpus, you just squeeze it, let's say to 200 topics, and you read the topics, and then kinda you understand what this corpus is all about. But is, the, the question was also from statistic, statistical point of view, is two, are 200 topics enough to represent this corpus, this huge corpus, yeah. Uh, so, and I, as I said, with the time, 
uh, when in Luxembourg uh, other uh, organizations or funders like uh, uh, FNR, FNR uh, when they saw it, they were like very interested. They were like, ah, okay, we actually financed uh, about 50 projects alone in Luxembourg uh, with, with a sum of half a million euros. But we don't know, you know, like we just completely lost the overview. Who is doing what? Uh, who is developing the vaccines? Who is uh, working on what? So, uh, and of course, the first thing they asked, uh, is it just the hype like everyone is publishing about uh, COVID-19 or is, is there a, a novelty? And can your t text mining tools uh, answer this question? So this is, this is actually where the added value uh, comes in. So yeah, uh, then uh, another question was what kind, of, um, what kind of algorithm we should use? And in our department, of course, everyone, the first instinct is to go for deep learning. Uh, but of course, we also know there are some other algorithms. I have here one uh, which is called uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, uh, or LDA in short. So we experimented with this. We experimented with word embeddings uh, as well. Uh, so word embeddings based clustering. Uh, we used also some deep learning technologies from scratch like BRT, BIRD. But with every this algorithm, so also our take is go for the simplest one uh, because uh, like the complex deep learning algorithms like BERT, BRT, which is very heavy to train. And if you have also like very, very big data set, uh, even your high processing computer, your supercomputer is not uh, able to, uh, to uh, calculate all, all this. And this was also apparent when we were doing uh, word embeddings, word embeddings space clustering. So uh, in word embeddings, if you are familiar with this, uh, you can set up the number of dimensions. Uh, also, this, uh, the number of dimensions, uh, this is arbitrary number. But the more dimensions you have, the more pr precise a word is descriptive uh, s semantically, actually. So if you go for 100 dimensions, this means a vector of a size of 100. Yeah, and this is a representation for every word in data set. So uh, basically, if you have, let's say, 35 gigs of text and you represent it in uh, word embeddings, you multiply it by 100, actually. So you get into the realm of, yeah, of uh, petabytes. So just uh, to mention it. So uh, yeah, just to clear uh, the terminology, so there are many things you can to do with a text. There is text categorization, yeah, uh, which actually puts the text into categories like sports, finance. So this is not uh, text mining, right? Uh, like the text categories, this is a bigger notion. And there, uh, there is another technique what we have, which is called text summarization. Uh, but this also creates whole sentences. So, but what we do did uh, the most was actually topic mining or yeah, topic discovery or topic tracking. <laughs> yeah. So also we need to be careful here as well because there is also the terminology is w uh, wild. So the the most used one is probably topic modeling. So where you just extract the keywords out of the text. And uh, of course in the paper, we also describe the, the uh, topic modeling from a probabilistic point of view with all, all the mathematics actually involved in it. Uh, but just to give you a simple definition, a simple formalization. So what we have is a collection of N documents Right, and then we can set up by, by ourselves how many uh, topics we want to extract, how, uh, what should be the number of topics. This is here uh, the K, and K is the, the variable we can uh, play with, we can set up. Uh, so, and K, uh, K uh, consists of topics, this is set a one to set a K, 
And what is important, you have the coverage of every topic in every document. So, and they add up to one. So this means uh, uh, one document can consist of many topics, of course, actually, which is intuitive thing uh, to do. So, and the, the topics then get a probability value uh, being about being present in the document. So this is it. So again, to give you an overview, like in a very uh, simple way, let's say uh, what we try to do here is not text categorization, but let's say our topic is called sports or travel or science. Then maybe our first document is now a certain percentage about sports, but the second one is zero percentage about sports. Right? And travel, but travel can be uh, both in document number one and document number two with different percentages. So it's a prob probabilistic process, actually, uh, what is going on here. Yeah, and you can, of course, again, if we simplify it very, you can just count the terms. Right, this is uh, what we, what I have shown here. But this is what uh, uh, we don't, what what we don't do with LDA. It, the statistics behind it is actually much more complicated. But yeah, just by co counting the numbers or getting the uh, what we say a relative frequency or relative uh, counts of the terms in a d document can tell you. Uh, to which topic this document belongs, actually. So what we did first uh, is pre-processing, as I mentioned before. The data was uh, or is still in JSON format, so we extracted from JSON. Uh, then we remove all the non-Unicode characters. Um, there, there are also lots of uh, characters describing chemical elements, there were formulas in these papers, so we just omitted all of this. And then we tokenized the text, of course you need to do this, uh, and we played also with lemmatizing or with stemming the text. But this is also debatable, uh, if it helps lemmatizing the text or, or not. So, yeah, and here a closer look if you would run your topic modeling and you would get the topics. And as you see here, actually uh, the topics are nothing other than the terms, the keywords combined together. So the most important keywords for one topic. And you see, uh, for example, the, 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 the first one here, this would be about health, COVID, but especially about workers, people, care, pandemic, risk. Uh, so probably the papers belonging to this topic, they uh, speak or they th thematize uh, the, uh, how uh, can be uh, workers taken care of who work actually in, in the pand pandemic situation, how, how high is, uh, is the risk and so on. And you see the, the second topic, we, we count from zero. And this one is about lung virus, uh, yeah, uh, about probably also figures because these are scientific papers. Yeah, about infection. So these uh, papers belonging to this topic, they probably discuss more the, the issues related to the virus itself and not, not to the pandemic. So it's not pandemic management. So yeah, this, these are all uh, the topics and they are all in, uh, interesting to look at, but because of the scale of the data set, again, as I said, it's very hard actually to, to get into all the topics and understand them. So what uh, we did actually, so we just uh, focused on some selected topics. And here I have, for example, two topics. Uh, again, the, here the topic number two would be more interesting, which is about gene, genome, genome sequencing. So this is probably about 
the research carried out uh, uh, in the domain of vaccines, uh, obviously. And the, the, the other topic, the topic number one, is more about uh, the mental health of students, children in the pandemic and how uh, the government should respond to that. And if you plot it, uh, and what I did, I plotted it up to uh, 5,000 documents because otherwise it would be again too big. Yeah, uh, so you see, so the first topic is, uh, so they are actually, they go hand in hand, uh, but uh, there are some papers, they are only focused uh, on, on the first topic. So this, uh, the, the, the um, uh, the y-axis is the probability, actually, uh, of the topic being in the document. And the y-axis are the numbers uh, of the topics. And the research, what uh, has been done in the genome sequencing, uh, as you see it here, it's actually more stable. So it's more stable, so people uh, have been working on it steadily. So this is the the take, uh, take of it. So again, uh, I, we looked at, again, we just picked up two uh, other topics. Uh, and because there was also like a talk in Europe about animals, uh, animal farms, uh, or animal, uh, yeah, and spreading the viruses in the farms, uh, working there. So this would be the plotting of, of this. So as you see, uh, this topic number two, it's not that much represented in the data set, which also seems uh, to be logical, actually. So the rest is in the paper. Thank you very much for listening, and I am open for questions. Uh, please ask uh, today. If not, just write me an email and stay healthy. Any question? No. Um, two quick questions. Um, one I missed, how did you do the tokenization? And secondly, the topics, were those, did you say that those were based on um, the keywords of the papers or, were, or did you do some sort of unsupervised machine learning to identify topics automatically? So let me rephrase uh, two questions. So the one question, the first one was, how did we tokenize the text, right? And the second one was, uh, did, did we just use the keyword search or did we go deeper into the text of the papers and did some unsupervised machine learning techniques? Right. right. So let's start with the first one. Tokenization is, like I always say, it's very important, <laughs> but everyone is like, no, let's, let's go to the analysis, go, go to the statistics and mathematics and let's keep the tokenization. It was very hard to do the tokenization. And uh, what I can tell you, it wouldn't be as sufficient if you just go and uh, say I will uh, take the spa space character and tokenize the text there, right? And uh, there are so many other characters which can be uh, uh, a sentence character, we call it like this, and there are some which can be word characters where you cannot uh, tokenize the text. Uh, so word characters, it would be uh, sometimes the apostrophe inside of the word, where you don't need actually to cut. If you would cut the, the word, it would, doesn't make sense, right? Uh, so, yeah, uh, we played a lot with tokenization again. And back into your uh, second question. Yes, actually this LDA, uh, what we used, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, it is uh, considered to be an unsupervised machine learning technique. So in the machine learning community, or let's say not even machine learning, because in the machine learning community, you have more algorithms like decision trees, random forests, uh, 
SVM, support vector machines, and of course, uh, linear models and deep learning, right? Uh, and there is also like this uh, small text mining NLP community inside the machine learning community, and they would use, or they would can consider LDA, uh, what we used uh, to be unsupervised machine learning algorithms, the, uh, algorithm which actually indeed goes into the body, into the text of the papers, uh, like I showed before, like abstract or body text. And uh, what it does, yeah, it actually extracts, it's very similar uh, to LSA, uh, maybe you know this latent semantic analysis yes. where we would actually do nothing else than we would vectorize the text, we uh, would create document term matrix and then compress this matrix uh, with, uh, uh, you know, like with uh, some dimensionality reduction algorithm um, uh, or just with matrix factorization and then we would squeeze uh, the yeah the documents uh, the number of documents to to the topics uh, what we call topics so an LDA what LDA do does LDA is extension of this uh, latent semantic analysis or probabilistic latent semantic al uh, analysis uh, which just f uh, formulates this problem probabilistically so it's just uh, the, the same phenomena phenomenon, because sometimes also LDA even is uh, regarded as dimensionality reduction algorithm sometimes. Yeah, so does it answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, any other question from the students? No questions? No, no se corten al preguntar eso. Okay. Siéntanse en confianza. Okay, mister, no more questions. I got a couple of questions. Thank you so much. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> uh, well, what's happened now because the pandemic is finishing with, with this analyze? Can you, what's your opinion about that? This is actually a very good question <laughs> because also when we were working at it, uh, like 2021, uh, last year, uh, you know, like everyone was saying, publish it finish this project because the pandemic is going to, to finish and then, yeah. But what I discover, um, again, uh, because we will probably never get, get rid the virus entirely. So COVID-19 is going to be a part of our life, but it's going to be in a more subtle way. So there will be still people thick uh, of COVID-19. There will be still, uh, uh, tendencies to uh, to produce new vaccines or open the old ones uh, to the public. So uh, for that, we discovered that even after like so uh, so long time the pandemic hit, still there are some uh, you know, governmental institutions uh, which are interested in it, and they uh, still ask questions and say, oh, okay. Uh, what happens there? Uh, do people still publish about COVID-19 or not? Yeah. Thank you are so welcome. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So I, will I hope you, you are having a great time over here in South America. Please. <laughs> I'm gonna ask the next authors, including myself, to be right on the 15 minutes of presentation and five minutes of questions because we are running short of time. Now, the presentation goes as keyword-based processing for assessing short answer, answers in the educational field, proposed by Javier Sanz Fallos, Luis de la Fuente Valentin, Elena Verdú. 
Any author here? Javier? Javier, are you here? Okay, so the screen is yours. Please remember um, the 15 minutes. I'm gonna warn you like one minute before. And then, well, I won't could you, but please stay on within the 15 minutes. Hello? Javier Sanz Fallos, Luis de la Fuente, Valentin, Valentin, y Elena Verdú. Okay, Javier, all yours. Do you hear me? Clear and strong. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm going to minimize this. Okay. So I'm trying to summarize the presentation. Uh, my name is Javier Sanz, and with the collaboration of Luis de la Fuente and Elena Verdú, I am presenting keyword-based processing for assessing short answers. This project is partially funded by the Plentas project. That um, uh, what seeks is the construction of an uh, semantic-based applications for grading short answers up until 200 uh, words. The evaluation is one of the most important tasks in, in the educational field, but this task is time consuming, tedious, and uh, it might be susceptible to some errors, um, speci especially in, in open-ended questions. Uh, for this reason, it is intended with this work to, um, to create a, a, a software application where we could contribute to the existing um, automatic or semi-automatic grading techniques. Uh, specifically, we, um, we <clears throat> focus on the keyword-based approach. And we are aware that there are some studies of uh, based on keywords, but uh, to the best of our knowledge, none of them uh, were included an augmented catalog of, of terms, and that's the key of our experiment. The use data set provided by Plentas um, has three subjects, uh, all of um, engineering uh, subjects, capture methods, business intelligence, and computer technology. And from the data set, we will extract the exam question, the set of key terms that are the words that the, the teacher expects to see in a good response and well, the students' responses and the score assigned by the teacher. So the objectives uh, will be to answer these research questions. The first one, how valid is a key term-based evaluation? And is there a correlation between the criteria used by examiners and the one proposed in this method? And the second one is, is it possible to generate competent feedback with this method? To assess these two questions, uh, the methodology we, we used first for automated scoring was the creation of a corpus that had to be in Spanish, balance and of general domain because it was intended for a word sense disambiguation. The corpus finally was extracted from Wikicorpus, that's a collection of text from the Wikipedia. Uh, we did a filtering process and we got uh, 32 of those texts. And then we, we created a dictionary uh, that will serve as a, uh, for the preprocessing pre task. This dictionary, uh, with a combination of the pipeline stanza, uh, was structured by levels, um, storing word, grammatical category, and lemma. Um, this is used for lemmatization and word says disambiguation. In fact, uh, for this task, we use the algorithm hidden Markov model, and that will be decoded by Viterbi. Uh, then we design an automatic key term, key term thesauri that uh, in that we, uh, there are stored the key terms of the um, or of the of the teacher, 
and those key terms are augmented with the synonyms and autonyms. This is made from automatic web scrapping from the word reference website. That is an online dictionary, uh, or, well, Spanish dictionary, I mean. Um, this thesauri uh, not only stores these words, but only, but also uh, indexes like compound that says if the key term is only one word or multiple of them, and for and others like uh, the grammatical category of the word. Then we propose both the thesauri uh, and the responses with the uh, typical um, methodology tokenization, lemmatizations, and then when we try to compare the, the words, our disambiguation in case if it's necessary. Uh, then we proceed to the key term matching. Uh, this is done with a variable window. Um, I, this is that each time we analyze the, the sentence, we do it with a um, different enneagram size. Um, then the key term matching is also uh, done with independence to new words because when tuning the hidden Markov models, we um, filter some uh, proper names, dates, and numbers, and store the information in one uh, token that is just like a buffer. So when, the, when a new word appears, it is assigned to this buffer token. Also, the key term matching was uh, done assuming that all keywords have the same importance. So the score would be the number of matches found in the in the response divided by the number of total key terms. For the feedback, we created a template of sentences that depends on the nature of the matching. And for each type of, of the matching, uh, the corresponding sentence was filled with the student's term. This is a uh, simple but very effective way to communicate and inform the, the person. Uh, in here, I'm showing um, an example of the program functioning and generating feedback. Uh, highlighted that some of the uh, key terms that are um, in the bag of words of one of the, um, the data sets, I, the, the subjects, sorry. Um, as it can be seen, the, the system uh, can identify um, keywords uh, in a straight way, just like uh, available, that is the, the blue one. Uh, it, uh, it can also um, identify uh, the synonyms of, of them, that is ACK, which is the green one, and it's a synonym of the keyword arbitrate. And then the system can also uh, detect uh, words like arbitrator that are um, potential false positive matches. If, uh, in this case, to the word to the keyword arbitrate, because they are not uh, in the same grammatical category and might not be um, expressed in the sense we we look for or, or we expect. Uh, then. Um, after validating the, that the system uh, found uh, all the uh, keywords in the response and the feedback was uh, correctly uh, generated, we um, compare the calculated mark and the real mark. And in those graphics, the in the X label is the student ID um, group from the lowest to the highest mark. And um, in the Y label is the qualification from zero to one. As it can be seen at first glance, there's no apparent relationship between between them. This, um, as this might have been caused because of the scoring formula, because some of the keywords might have more importance in the mark, we decided to um, analyze with a um, correlation matrix the importance of those keywords uh, with respect with the mark. Uh, what we saw is that none or, uh, all of them have had a, a no significant relations, correlation with the mark, so that the um, 
that discarded the idea of the the difference um, being because of the the formula. With that uh, being said, the conclusions of the study was that the um, the evaluation method is not adequate. It can be um, uh, this can be due to the um, a, bad, a poor selection of the of the keywords, or just because even if it's a, a short answer, maybe keywords are not um, suitable for capturing all the essence of the response. But we have to we don't have to forget that uh, this is just a similarity score and also might not be adequate to compare just with the mark. Instead, it might it should be combined with some other techniques. Um, for example, now we, we are working in a similarity with uh, word embeddings. So this this score should be combined with with other scores and with other levels of of uh, analysis. That is what is done in in Plentas. Um, nevertheless, investigation and experiment experimentation into the research question one, reversing the implemented procedure, is recommended because generating the key the, the key terms from the text might be a good approach, not only for extracting the essence of the answer, but to, to be useful for feed a feedback generator engine. Um, well, the procedure for obtaining the augmented catalog of terms has, be, has proven useful in expanding the concept of words in a keyword-based study. So if the generation of key terms was to be approached, uh, it's recommended to to do it with this augmented catalog. On the other hand, the more syntactic tagger was in, was validated to perform adequately, uh, especially and, and can be optimal uh, to use it, especially in cases in which the corpus has low extension. And finally, whilst this study this did not confirm the research question two, it did partially substantiate that the extraction of keywords might be interesting for the generation of a particular feedback, as I have previously mentioned. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, uh, thanks for the attention. Any question? No questions over here? The students, no hay preguntas de su parte? Tenemos estudiantes tímidos hoy. Javier, uh, if you have to resume your work in only one place, uh, can you do it right now? You can speak in Spanish if you want. Uh, but okay, but I I think I haven't understand the the question. I just want to I just want you to resume your work to brief your work in only one sentence. I think uh, the perfect sentence for that would be um, that this area, particularly in, in the research in Spanish, uh, has to uh, um, uh, have more more study and more investigations because all things are being studied in English. And uh, well, contributions like this, even though results might not be uh, as as good as uh, some of the um, uh, some other techniques uh, like uh, word embedding techniques or or other like that uh, might be good for contribu for contributing to this area in in Spanish. Okay, thank you so much, Javier. Uh, well, I'm going to ask the audience to give me an applause. The presentation is done, so you can clap now.
Okay, guys, the next presentation is mine, so just give me a second. We are also waiting for the translator, so no translation now. Estamos esperando a la persona que hace la traducción, entonces no hay traducción por ahora. Okay. Um, I don't want to be rude, but uh, it seems like we can start now. I'm a little bit concerned that the people over here don't understand my English, so the translation is pretty good. Can you understand what I'm saying right now? I'm going to speak slowly so everyone can get it. I'm going to go really fast because we already consumed the first five minutes. Okay, this is medicine. I need to warn you. This part is important. <laughs> Let me know when the Spanish goes on. Goes on? You listening in Spanish? Let me know. No yet? Okay, this is medicine. I'm going to show you the most prevalent malady in the humankind. This is about a problem that happens in our vessels, in our arteries. You know, the flood goes up to the brain, and there are some blockages that appear because of our bad habits. So this is important for you, but also for the people a little bit grown up, because this is killing humans. I'm going to warn you that you will see some images that are disturbing. Close your eyes. It's not my intention to bother you, but close your eyes, OK? OK, stenosis. That's called stenosis, and it kills a lot of people. Why? Because it's a blockage that appears in the carotid artery, and the carotid artery feeds oxygen to the brain. So the consequences are either being dead or that you are not able to walk, you are not able to read, to speak, to see properly. The damage is random. So we don't know what's going to happen, but something is going to happen, OK? So you need to take care of this. I will go really fast on this background. Where it appears? Well, I guess it's clear where it appears. It's in your neck. And there is one external carotid, and the other one is the internal carotid. The problem is that that bifurcation collects grossy substance and other things that you will see on the screen. And that thing happens because we eat too much hamburgers because we don't do sports and other good habits. Well, this is the problem. It's not only that the blockage is going to retain or to stop the blood fluid. The problem also happens because the fluid changes. So when the flow change, you start receiving less oxygen in your brain. The symptoms are going to be described next. OK, where I already explained it, in the carotid artery. What blockages? They call atheromes or plaques. And they retain the fluid. They are created because th that blockage is created by fat, cholesterol, calcium, connective tissue, and inflammatory cells. So it grows over there in, inside your cells. It's growing all the time. Since you are born, you start accumulating those substances in that part of the neck, inside your, your arteries. No vessels, but arteries. OK, what it causes? As I told you, chest pain, fatigue, sweating, 
jaw, abdominal pain, loss of vision, slurred speech, trouble talking, sudden and severe headache, dizziness, and loss of balance. Sometimes when you see people, they complain about losing the balance, people used to think that their hearing is the one bothering. But it's not all the time like that. Sometimes it's your vessels that are bothering, okay? And it's because of your bad habits. I'm going to say this several times because I'm taking care of your health. That's my intention here. Um, stop. <laughs> Why? This is very important. Age is one of the causes, it's one of the elements that corroborate with this pathology. But the other one is being a male. So if you are a male, go and start running. Girls can be a little bit fatty if you want. They are really concerned about it, but they are not in big danger. You are, you know, that we grow those big bellies, we are in danger. Smoking, hopefully nobody here smokes. Uh, hypertension, poor diet, low physical activity, high cholesterol. I say cholesterol, I put it twice. What is a big complication? An embolus. That plaque can just detach one part and it's going to go to the brain. And that thing is going to create another part of blockage inside the brain. That's very dangerous. Okay? And severe stenosis means that the plaque is growing so much that it completely or 70% blocks the vessel or the artery. Oh, first, one of three deaths in the U.S. is caused by this pathology. So you know the incidence now. This is a serious topic. Okay, the disgusting images. I'm going to go and walk over here in order to signal the image. The first frame is to expose the region. There is a muscle over there, which is the strongest muscle. Uh, they say that is the strongest muscle. So you need to separate that muscle. You need to remove that muscle. You just move it away. And then you expose the artery. That bulb over there, that one in the second frame, is the artery. Then you need to block all the arteries because you need to stop the flow of the, of the blood. So you, you need to grab some tapes and you wrap them around the vessels. Those things that are blue and white are those wraps. Um, then you open the vessel because this thing is being collected inside the vessel. So when you open that, you need to use this string. This is a tube, and that tube make, makes a bypass. I don't know if the translation is getting me well. <laughs> Did you understand what I say? The translation is, is properly. If it's kind of weird, raise your hand and ask me because I can speak in Spanish. Is it okay? The translation? Okay. I don't hesitate the translation is okay. It's because sometimes I speak too fast or not pronouncing very well, so translation gets kind of weird. Okay, when you open the vessel and you have all the straps over there, you can go inside with a tool and grab the blockages piece by piece. You need to be careful, well, the doctor needs to be very careful with every piece. If he lets any piece inside, when the flow returns, that's gonna take those embolus to the brain. Okay, images, which is the important topic here, or a topic that concerns me. Um, this is an image created with echo. This is echography. With echography, you can see that the atherome, the plaque, reflects in a different manner, so you will see the reflection as a blue over there. So we know that there is a blockage over there. It's not very sharp, very precise, but it's enough to know that this person got a blockage. The beautiful CT images. CT images are three-dimensional images that are created with X-rays. X-rays are ionizing radiation. So it creates cancer. 
I always disencourage this technique, but I must admit that this technique is beautiful. It is not created directly. You need to put a contrast agent inside your body. So it's a disgusting, for some people, a disgusting test. You need to receive via, uh, how do you call it? Your ink? How do you call that? Needle. Via needle, you receive a contrast agent that is going to your bloodstream and it's going to create a kind of metal sensation in your taste and it's going to create a sensation of urination all the time. So it's not pleasant but it's okay because it allows us to see every vessel in your body. The problem, I'm gonna read this part. It is desirable that to quantify the severity of stenosis, I'm gonna start again for the sake of the translation. It is desirable to quantify the severity of stenosis from the image to derive a precise procedure. That's what we want. But the question is how to assert accurate segmentation of the plaque. What you, are, what you are about to see is very clinical. We are scientists and we sometimes deal with very complicated problems. But I work inside a hospital. I'm not interested in solving complicated problems, but I'm interested in giving solutions. So that's why you will see a very simplistic approach but works in the hospitals. This is the kind of images that we create with CT. We just put the same element, but it goes around your body. So you make a projection, make a projection, make a projection, and with that information, you can create a volume. A state of the art, a state of the art is that the doctors or the people assisting the doctors, they grab the images and they apply a technique called threshold. Threshold is just saying the intensities of the image that are above this level, I'm gonna take them off. I'm gonna keep the ones that are below. That's called threshold. And it creates this kind of segmentations. This, this technique is called segmentation. When you apply a very low threshold with a seed, you're gonna have part of the vessel. This is an actual view of the vessel. So you see, where you move the thresholds, you are gonna get more information or less information. They need to do it with every, every, every artery. They get every artery and they apply the threshold. This is human depending. The human is the one defining what is a vessel and what is an atherome or a plaque. So we need to do it automatically. The clinical approach, if you accept thresholding, as I told you, this is a clinical solution. Well, let's do it well. And how we make it well? I need to tell you this. CT is a technique that's supposed to have traceability worldwide. That's supposed to be the same exam here. If you do it here, you are supposed to get the same pattern of intensities here in the hospital, I don't know how is it called, the hospital here, than if we do it in my country or in the United States. That's what is being said. Technically speaking, it's like that. But it doesn't happen all the time. I'll show you enough evidence. Okay, so we grab four institutions and we grab a lot of patients from those institutions. And we make a statistical study, a very simplistic approach among all those four institutions. These are French institutions. What we got? Well, we just went to the city, we grabbed the intensities around a point, and we study the four, no, the three zones inside the vessel. So the three zones inside the vessel are called lumen, calcification, and background. Lumen is the artery. Calcification is the plaque or the blockage. And background is the other thing existing in the image, which is the dark parts. In the first institution, we got these numbers. I will pass very fast over here because you need to see those numbers. Those numbers are, look at over here. A statistics for lumen over there, a statistics for calcification, and a statistics for background. Why we make it like that? This is a specific from 
that institution, which is institution one. So with those numbers, you give them to the doctor, he will need to create the thresholds, but at least he knows statistically where to go. So this is the big approach. This is the big value of these things. So now doctors, they don't go and try to look where to put the thresholds. Now they use these numbers. Okay, institution two, institution three, and four. I'm almost done. Okay, this is the conclusion. Usually you speak the conclusion, but I prefer to present an image as a conclusion. The first thing that we say over here is that despite the fact, all told, people say that Hounsfield units, that means the images created with CT are the same in the whole world, that's not true. It depends on setup. You will see the differences between the three institutions. The, well, I put four institutions over there. And you will see the difference with uh, the data provided by someone called Leonardo Flores. And if you try to solve the issue, or that explains why when you try to solve the issue with your own thresholds, it usually fails. But now, with this work, you know how to capture the thresholds per inch institution. And these are the written conclusions. Hounsfield units are not stable. Instead, they are specific from institutions. So you need to repeat this exercise in every institution if you, need, if you want to be accurate. Setup influences intensities. I already said that. Thresholding cannot follow the variations created in the different centers. Thresholding is a very old technique, but it's still used in the hospitals. Every center must configure the segmentation systems. As I told you, we have very sophisticated methods to do segmentation, but this is the one that works in the hospitals. Physicians believe that they can provide the thresholds by themselves. There is no overlapping in the zones. This is good. I say favorable, but this is good. This is good because if there is no translapping, you can separate the zones in a very efficient manner. Artificial in intelligence can become handy. Well, everything can be solved by artificial intelligence, but physicians sometimes are reluctant to use it. From a clinical perspective, the separability has been accomplished. We did our job. This is done, and this is applicable for any institution. We are done. Algorithms cannot be shared among institutions. That's very important. The information that you grab from one institution, you cannot pretend to move it for a, to another one. It doesn't work. And if it works, that's the problem. They give you a solution, but that solution is not accurate. That's all. Thank you so much. I guess I'm within the time. I'm within the time? Thank you. Any question? Yes, yes, there is an influence of genetics in all the uh, pathologies associated to the heart. Um, but the problem with genetics is that it appears randomly. So we cannot anticipate it unless we got a bunch of data, which is the data that artificial intelligence specialists like my friend here uses in order to anticipate what's going to happen. But yeah, all of us, we are influenced by our habits yeah, and also by genetics. I'm going to check in the chat, sir. Okay. Anyone raising their hand? Otherwise, I'm going to give a space for the people. Adenji, any question? I guess it's the person asking if he has a presentation here. Okay. Los muchachos, ¿tienen alguna pregunta? No se corten nuevamente. Esto es un ejercicio buenísimo para ustedes. ¿Tienen alguna pregunta? ¿Ninguna? Les da pena del otro. Adelante, por favor. Vas a hablar como Shakira por el micrófono. Lo que quería preguntar es, ¿cómo nos podemos dar cuenta que... O sea, uno de los síntomas principales para darnos cuenta que 
esto es lo que nos puede suceder o nos está pasando actualmente? Muy buena pregunta. Lo que pasa es que me metes en unos problemas. Mira, generalmente cuando escribo alguna, alguna cuestión médica como ingeniero, suelo, suelo ser perfeccionista. Cuando voy al médico quiero que me diga, tenés esto y lo que tenés que hacer es esto. Pero en medicina, la medicina no ha sido creada así. Hay mucha aproximación, no somos determinísticos. Entonces, si tú tienes un mareo, eso puede ser el oído el que te está fallando, y más a tu edad, pero si no es el oído y te hacen el test de prueba, de, de esos que hacen los tonos y todo eso y estás bien, entonces lo otro que van a ver es tu estómago. Y si ya han descartado todo, ojo, colonoscopia y endoscopia, ¿no? que son bien malucas, eh, lo que van a tratar de ver es qué pasa por tu cabeza. Y cuando ven tu cabeza, los mecanismos diagnósticos lo que hacen es un CT como esto, que no es fácil de hacer porque ya te lo digo, tiene que tener un producto de contraste, se llama gadolinio y no todo el mundo lo tolera. Y lo otro es hacerlo con resonancia magnética, hay una técnica que como tu sangre lleva oxígeno, necesita hierro, una molécula de hierro para que se le pegue la de oxígeno. Y la de hierro, la molécula de hierro, como está dentro de un campo magnético, hace que las imágenes se muevan un poquito. Entonces, con eso pueden ver dentro de tus eh, arterias. ¿Lo expliqué bien? ¿Lo entendieron? Listo. Entonces, ya se puede ver dentro de las arterias, pero es muy difícil ver la placa. Entonces, utilizan el CT que es más sensible, ¿sí? pero eso ya sería un último examen. Y para responderte a ti, a ti no te lo harían nunca porque estás muy joven. ¿Ok? ¿Any other question? Sí, yeah. hello. Good evening. Yes, we hear you. Yeah, please. I, I want to ask a question. Uh, I want to appreciate the presenter. The presentation was very interesting. But I just want to get some clarification. There are two diagrams that depict the results that was gathered in this uh, research. The first one was from slide 25, and the other one was in the previous slide. I discovered that there was no acronym that described the data for both X and Y. Adenji, we hear you kind of bad. I don't know if you can write a question. Can you? And how, you know, how it's number one. Number two, that was implemented classification. Thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, because of yeah. the time, we are missing one presentation. Actually, it's Mr. Adenji, the author, but he sends yeah. a video. I guess no more question about this topic, which, is, which has very disgusting images. Um, so we are going to go directly to the next presentation. What about the video? Do we have it? Thank you so much, by the way. The topic of the presentation is text encryption with advanced encryption standard for near field communication NFC using Afman compression. The presenters are Adeni G.O.D., Olani Elias Akiola, Adomola Uluashola, Olamidia Fulabi of the Department of Computer Science. The agenda of the presentation are as follows. Introduction, problem statements, review on literature's methodology, results, and discussion conclusion. Introduction, the combination of Afman code with some cryptographic algorithms 
such as symmetry encryption algorithm will guarantee multi-level security. This poses a lot of challenges. In order to protect the original word list from intrusion without damaging the existing bits. The focus of this study is to mitigate against intrusion in the level of communication transaction between the card and the reader. Privacy and authentication are the major concern in reading frequency identification system. The protocol implementation in transfer of ownership in mobile application normally consider handheld components from reader to back server. So to secure and provide counterfeit measures, transaction of RFID system, where tax with limited resources are very important, there is need to provide an ownership transfer which has been developed to improve the maintenance of specific application. And these applications are being applied in the area of computer computing, logistic management and traceability. Crypto analysis has been also implemented in protocols such as EPC C1G2 standard, thereby analyzing the level of security. The focus of the algorithm when it was tested is to reduce collusion and use time division multiplexing. The implication of this is majorly to correct reverse protocol error correction. So encryption is a technology for protecting sensitive data. Most algorithms used in encryption combine both properties. Basically, encryption usually hides sensitive data of users, which are used for information retrieval. So data encryption standard DES can encrypt and decrypt using shared secret key in form of block ciphers. So AES is fast and flexible to crack ciphers doing operation requires the use of different multiple keys. Problem statement. Half mount code and access both code word this with encoded bits in order to, to decode the message. In this way, improper error correction algorithm with encoded bits can be damaged, resulting to a total loss of information. So what we are trying to 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 to, to find out or to provide solution to in this study is how we can mitigate the loss of information. However, the code list and the code bits sent to the receiver requires some certain high level of transmission time. So there are need to provide countermeasures techniques to secure and fix the damaged and dead bits. In these studies, we review some uh, papers that are related to the topic of presentation and paper one and two discusses the limited computational and energy resources due to low complexity and high compression efficiency. Symmetric key block cipher algorithm was developed describing the analysis of server algorithm. Offline coding was presented in that study and it was applied to different data such as video, image, text, and other formats. The observation is that characters with shorter string of bits are used for less common source symbol. In another related study, provided an efficient compression method which can map individual source symbol to unique string. But the significant rule of encryption algorithm are numerous and essential in information security as adopted in literature 7 in comparative study of symmetric cryptography mechanism. Another paper was reviewed, thereby stating the level of attacks that have been predefined and to also provide the various level of characteristics in the nature of the attack as it was proposed in paper 8. A secure text encryption with near-feed communication using abnormal compression was also proposed in paper 9. Character proximity for RFID smart certificate system, which is used to curb forgery minerals, was provided in paper 13. Materials and methods. The design of this study are in four modules. One, module one, is information system module ISM, the card interactor module CIM, 
the middle where we do MMM and the ISM is the center of the of the system and consists of three modules which are the core infrastructure and the web API. The core is the center of the system, it implements the entity, the business rules and makes sure data is securely accessed. Infrastructure layer handles external concern on the database, calling an external endpoint, sending email. The card interactor, mo interactor module, CRM, is the second part of the design architecture. Basically, the CRM is the hardware and the CRM is the API communication with the card through the interface provided through dependency injection. Interactor's middleware is the third stage which consists of reciprocity, logic, security, and the interface. The, the repository is a storage mechanism that hosts both structure and structural information. During the simulation, the logic layer ensures that the information created or updated are in conformity with the set of canonical rules. The logical, ensure, the logical layer ensures integrity. Below is the logical layer is the security which ensures that information of the system are properly secure from, from an unauthorized action. So the simulation was implement, implemented using reader ACR 1311 which supported both Bluetooth and USB 2.0 connection. The near field communication card is in Wi-Fi. Below diagram shows the algorithms for implementation. The first stage is to check the AES mode. When that is done, it, is conf it configures the unique character register. It passes it to write the payload to the buffer. But if this is achieved, the AC it passes this information to the AES mode. But if not, it goes back to the configuration unique character register to configure the, the set of AES mode again. But if that is achieved, that will be passed to AES mode, which generates unique character mode. And after that, keys are generated to the unique character mode, and it provides an output result. These results are written back to the buffer, and the buffer will send an interrupt of unique character for registration, and that will terminate the process. This diagram shows the development of the solution which we are coded with C sharp and with other tools with the card. This first interface shows the starting pulling. Here the card was not detected. But in this other diagram, in this other interface, we have the interactor windows card being detected which shows the initialization of the ACR 1311 PICC reader and the card status which are represented in hexadecimal and it shows us the active protocol T equals to 1 and the card type my file standard 1K. After the simulation, since our investigation is particularly invest is, is particularly showing the importance of entropy. The password predicts how a given password will be cracked through a root trap or guessing. So we have about three, four equations here that the P works. The above equation two, three, and four shows how difficult the password will be guessed. And it is important that at least one character is chosen from each of these three sets. There are six character key is further separated and ash before the beta security is implemented. So the higher the entropy of the initial text, the more accommodating the output size to change in the value of n. There is also a direct correlation between the value of n and the output size as seen in figure below. Here when n equals to 100, this data we are captured and can see the output size and the number of unique character. Another experiment was performed when n equals to 200. It also depicts the pattern in which the number of unique 
So the performance evaluation to determine the time required for encryption was conducted in another related experiment. Here, when n equals to 50, it was gathered that the CBC and the ECB at a year's running mode shows that unique character equals to 2 and the CBC optimal is 0 0.13 microseconds and ECB at optimality is 0 0.12 microseconds and the symbol, symbol, the symbol by symbol restriction drops with a known input distribution but when n equals to 100 with a unique character of 2 the running mode of CBC was 0 0.13 microseconds at optimum and the ECB was 0 0.05 microseconds. Also, a single code may be insufficient. In this case, all the single code may be insufficient for optimality. And the last experiment that was conducted was when n equals to 200 and the unique character was 0 0.05 in AES running mode and the CBC at optimum was 0 0.23 microseconds and ECB at Ultima was 0 0.23 microseconds. The important performance determinant is the time required for encryption. AES was implemented in both ECP and CBC cipher mode to compare performance as shown below. The single by single cipher mode can determine the correlation running time, thereby protecting the level of communication transaction between the card and the reader. Conclusion. Redundancy and pattern of stored content with less space is assured in the development of this study. Unique character has different location on the tree. The character may not represent the same numbers of bit length. The developed module in this research used AES techniques to secure and fix the unique number of characters at different locations on the tree, with n denoted in the solution. So the use of application protocol D APDU as a medium of communication between a smart reader and a smart card contains mandatory by acknowledgement. The research was conducted at the Department of Computer Science, University of Baden, Nigeria, and the author thanks the department for their support in this research work. The references can be found. Thank you so much, Adenji. Um, any questions? Okay, when the presentation approaches to the launch time, the probability of having questions decreases. That's a <laughs> fact. Thank you so much, Adenji, for being with us. Thanks a lot for You're your welcome. video presentation. Uh, well, with this presentation, I end the session for today. This was the data or data analysis session. We invite you for the next sessions in the afternoon. ICT-based social innovation, image processing and robotics, and, well, software architectures and software design engineering. Thank you so much, and we will see you in the afternoon here. Um, don't know what time over there. Thank you so much. <laughs>